Piracy has probably existed since people first took to the seas. Beginning in the 14th century BCE, we start to see written accounts of these marauders engaging in wars, epic sea battles, and looting. Piracy seemed to achieve its most profitable and mythic era during the Golden Age of Piracy, usually placed between 1650 and 1750. The amount of pirates and their incredible stories never ceased to amaze curious minds. While the Golden Age has its fair share of horrifying and successful pirates, this time period overshadows the life and times of other fascinating piratical characters in history. Polycrates was making innovations in naval techniques and piracy in ancient Greece, while the famous Cheng Shi built her piratical empire in early 1800s China. Least discussed of all pirates have been the lake and river pirates throughout time. Sources are either scarce or non-existent. Perhaps they do exist in some obscure archive, but they can be near impossible to find. From this low amount of information, legends can easily evolve. One of these lake pirates made a name near my hometown of Milwaukee in Lake Michigan. Dan Seavey is seldom discussed in pirate history books, but he may be just as interesting as the pirates of the Golden Age. Join me on today's quest while we uncover the story of Roaring Dan Seavey. <laughs> Dan Seavey was born in Maine in 1865. His father was a schooner captain, so Dan grew up in the life of a seafarer. At 13, in 1878, Seavey started working aboard local vessels helping with fishing and shipping. His legendary career began when he was 18. In 1883, Seavey joined the U.S. Navy and served for three years. After learning the nuances of sea travel, he had a brief stint working as a deputy marshal at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, where he, quite poetically, tracked bootleggers and smugglers on reservations. During this time, as the story goes, Seavey cornered a liquor smuggler near the upper peninsula of Michigan. They fought for a bit before Seavey is said to have dropped a piano on the criminal who later died from his injuries. Of course, the veracity of this claim is in question, but with a man of CV's size, over six feet tall, and his strength, perhaps he tipped the piano over. His life as a law-abiding citizen would soon begin to fade, however. In the 1890s, he met and married Mary Plumley, and they moved to Milwaukee. Here, they started a life together, had children, and even opened a saloon near Milwaukee's harbor. This would prove to be a major turning point in his life. When he was running his business, he met the founder of a famous brewery. He befriended Frederick Pabst, the namesake of Pabst Beer. In 1896, Pabst told C.V. about the gold rush taking place in northern Canada, the Klondike Gold Rush. Gold was found in the Yukon in 1896, and about 100,000 people set out to mine and pan for gold. More than half turned back in the face of the harsh journey through the Great White North, Potentially, one could become rich and never have to worry about making money again. Surprisingly, most of the people going on the trek were white-collar workers, with only a few miners. C.V., unsurprisingly, jumped at the idea of mining for gold in the Yukon, and journeyed off. Sadly, the trip would yield a huge financial loss for C.V. The mining was difficult, as miners had to burn through up to 100 feet of permafrost. When C.V. arrived, the area was likely tapped for all it was worth. C.V. returned to Milwaukee, but quickly vanished into Lake Michigan, leaving his family behind. After this, Mary changed her name from Mary C.V. to Mary Silver, a move that we will return to later. In 1900, C.V. resurfaced in Escanaba, Michigan, and remarried. Just four years later, his new wife filed for divorce on account of him beating her repeatedly. After the filing, C.V. fled and once again remarried. It was during this time that his infamous career would flourish. He would engage in plenty of legal actions. He attempted logging, timber milling, and was even a well-known prize fighter. His amazing fighting ability stood out, but his legal actions would soon live in the shadow of his illegal ones. It was around this time that he began smuggling, poaching, bootlegging, and even pimping. He set up an illegal fish trap, but was soon distraught by the fact that thieves began stealing from the trap. This prompted him to set up a trip line to a bell, which alerted him when someone was stealing his fish. At this time in Chicago, horse racing had become the new fad. Supposedly, there was a type of marsh hay that, when fed to horses, would enhance their performance. The problem was that the hay only grew in the Upper Peninsula. 
Seavey made quite a lot of money smuggling and selling these goods. It's unclear, but there is a chance that Seavey was the one who spread this lie in the first place. His schooner, which would become a staple in Seavey's life, was called the Wanderer. For a number of years, the ship served as a floating brothel. At the time, prostitution was outlawed, but because the law's authority ended at water's edge, the floating brothels were not in anyone's jurisdiction. This led to floating brothels becoming a very common thing to find near port towns. The captains would fill their boats with wenches and mead, and the party would begin. After four years of avoiding the law, his rule over Lake Michigan would come to an end. On June 29, 1908, he would be arrested for stealing a timber ship called the Nellie Johnson. Before we delve into the interesting story of Seavey's final days as a pirate, we need to discuss the value of timber at the time. Our story begins in the 1890s. At this time, timberlands were the most valuable mineral lands in the US. This meant that timberland owners, who owned land before this decade, could easily become incredibly wealthy. The timber business was not an easy one, however. Because of the land's worth, some shady practices developed. On one hand, it was perfectly legal for timber landowners to sell construction rights on their land for the emerging growth in railroad building. On the other hand, the land laws themselves were complex, so not very many people could understand them and use them to their advantage. Many of the landowners of the era had prominent politicians in their corner. They would pay off congressmen, senators, and legislators to make sure no conservation laws were passed and to ensure current land laws were not enforced. In fact, in 1897, President Cleveland signed an executive order to establish a large number of national forests, and this was met with enormous backlash from corrupt politicians. The richest and most powerful of these landowners was Frederick Weyerhaeuser. Working with timber most of his adult life, he was very comfortable with investing in the timberlands when they were sold for a low price. By the time he was 36, his business began to grow. He had three timber mills but slowly acquired more and more land until he owned most of the available timberlands in the US. Just like the other timberland giants of the day, his corruption was widespread. In 1906, the Interstate Commerce Commission did an investigation into these business practices and finally uncovered the truth. Weyerhaeuser was the richest man you have never heard of. When the investigation began, your everyday working Joe never would have heard of this person but behind the scenes, he was pulling the strings to his benefit. Soon after the investigation, Weyerhaeuser was in the public eye, and people began to realize how much control this man had. At the time, he was said to be richer than Rockefeller, with his net worth being estimated anywhere between $7.6 billion to $15.2 billion, and this is adjusted for inflation. He would keep his status and wealth until his death not too long after the trial, in 1914. When Dan Seavey stole the Nellie Johnson, this is whose business he was messing with. Weyerhaeuser probably never heard of Seavey, and Seavey probably had no effect on Weyerhaeuser's life or business. But considering the fact that regular workers had a hard time getting timberlands, it's easy to see why stealing the timber would be a profitable move. At least in theory. So in 1908, Seavey stole the Nellie Johnson filled with timber with the intention of selling it when he stopped at Chicago. Seavey, until his dying day, claimed that he actually won the Nellie Johnson from its captain, R.J. McCormick, by drinking him under the table. Whether or not this is true, Seavey set off with the ship from Montague, Michigan, and headed to Chicago. It's not clear why, but it seemed he couldn't unload at Chicago, so Seavey went north. On his way, however, he would run into a problem. McCormick contacted the United States Revenue Cutter Service, a governing entity concerned with maritime law enforcement. They sent the Revenue Cutter ship Tuscarora from the Chicago port after Seavey. These ships traveled much faster than the Nellie Johnson, and soon enough, the Tuscarora was hot on Seavey's trail. A week-long chase ensued, and in an attempt to escape, Seavey traveled to New Haven, on the opposite side of Lake Michigan. Here, he ditched the Nellie Johnson and went aboard his infamous schooner Wanderer. The chase would soon end and the Tuscarora cornered Wanderer. Seavey was arrested and charged with mutiny and sedation on the high seas. The day after, the New York Times released an article describing this chase and claimed that the Tuscarora fired a shot to stop Seavey in his tracks. However, this is probably an embellishment, 
as the official logbook of the Tuscarora would have documented a shot being fired. CV ended up being set free, however. It's not clear why. Perhaps the owner of the Nelly Johnson failed to appear in court. Sadly, no transcript of the hearing survives, and the arrest warrant no longer exists. CV would live quietly for the next decade and reemerge in the 1920s. Living in Escanaba, Michigan, CV would still sail and fish. His schooner Wanderer would come to a tragic end in a fire during the late 1910s, so he had to acquire a new ship. It's hard to gauge the entirety of CV's personality at this time. Thomas Dale Vanetti, an Escanaba native, recounted a story from his childhood. In the 1920s, he and some friends were stealing apples from CV's ship. When CV saw this, he decided to just give them some fresh apples. While he was nice to kids, he wasn't so nice to a fellow sailor, Nels Jepsen. Nels was a Washington Island resident for a long time, and in the summer of 1920, he had an encounter with CV that he would not soon forget. Him and CV had known each other for years, but that didn't stop CV from trying to coerce Nels into giving him his ship. Nels needed some gas for his boat, and CV offered him a trade. Nels would give CV his ship in exchange for CV's own ship and some gas. Nels knew his ship was far better than CV's, but with a threat of violence looming over him, he didn't know what to do. Nels decided to stay in town and wait until CV was preoccupied. So while CV was busy one night, Nels got back onto his ship and made a swift getaway under cover of night. We now return to the bold move of Mary's name change to Mary Silver. In 1923, CV and a business partner purchased some land. During a review of title transactions, a fascinating deed was found. The document stated that Mary Silver waived all dower rights to the property being purchased by John Silver. Dower rights allow a spouse to earn one-third life estate interest in property. Apparently, Dan and Mary were never legally divorced, and it seems like after CV's run-ins with the law, Mary and Dan may have rekindled their relationship and went under the guise of John and Mary Silver. Any fan of pirates will remember that John Silver, or Long John Silver, was the name given to a primary character in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Although CV denied ever being a pirate, it seems this was a nod to his brief piratical career. In 1927, CV suffered a burn injury and his right arm had become paralyzed, effectively ending his life as a sailor and he was forced to retire in his 60s. In the 1930s through the 1940s, CV lived a quiet life on the border of Michigan and Wisconsin before dying in a nursing home on Valentine's Day 1949 at the age of 84. CV spent most of his life trying to achieve financial success during some hard times. His businesses never went anywhere. His trek through the Yukon and participation in the gold rush amounted to nothing, and his theft of timber, one of the most valuable natural resources of the time, backfired. Seavey's life was a mix of great adventures and large-scale crimes. From floating brothels to trafficking what amounts to horse steroids, Seavey always had some interesting scheme up his sleeve. So was the life of Dan Seavey, Lake Michigan's only pirate. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoy our content and want to help support this channel, check out our Patreon and Teespring links in the description. If you don't want to spend money, but still see what we're doing outside of YouTube, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also, make sure to check out our website, milwaukeeatheists.com. We'll see you next time.